Good morning. That, that's really what it comes down to, isn't it? Is to really believe what Jesus says about himself and what he says about us, isn't it? Boy, if, if we can be in the good of those two realities, everything else may be painful, may be hurtful, may be difficult, but everything else will just fall in line under those two paramount realities, what Jesus, who Jesus is, and who he says we are in him, right? And so I was thinking of the psalmist's words in Psalm 45, where he says that I am indicting a good matter because I speak concerning the king. And I feel that's the place we are at this morning. There's no better place, there's no sweeter place to be than where we are right now in the presence of the Lord, to just hear of him and learn of him and, and to worship him and to be amazed by him. And you know, uh, we've been doing a series. We started a series last week. Pastor Pat started us off. It's on the seven I am statements that Jesus makes recorded for us in the Gospel of John. The seven I am statements. And I, I would encourage you and challenge you uh, to memorize these seven I am statements. You know, they're, they're short, concise statements. Um, but try to get them all down, all seven. Just as a reminder, in John 6, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And, and maybe it also is helpful to, to put a little bit of a descriptor next to that. What does that verse say to you? Even if you can get it down to one word. I put it into the word provision. Jesus is my provider, my provision. And then when we come to John chapter 8, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And I see in that that he is my vision and supervision. Jesus, the light of the world. In John chapter 10, Jesus says, I am the door. The imagery there is, is of a sheep pen, and Jesus is the, is the one who guards what comes in and what goes out. He is the door, and, and for me, I put down access that in Jesus I have access to the throne of God. Again, in John chapter 10, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And, and in that, I, I put down, that's, that's my right or my authority to be a child of God, is that Jesus laid down his life for me, the good shepherd. Today, we're going to look at the I am statement that's found in, in John chapter 11 and in John chapter 14, hopefully. In John chapter 11, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. And I see in that Jesus is making a statement that he is all that is necessary for us to have true quality of life. And I'm going to leverage a little bit of psychological concept, quality of life. We've all heard that concept in Jesus, we find all the quality of life we could ever desire. I am the resurrection and the life. And we come to John 14 as well, another I am statement I, I hope to look at today. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And in that, I put down meaning of life. That it's in Jesus being my way, our way, my reality or truth, your reality or truth, my life source, your life source, I found the true meaning of my life. And then lastly, the seventh one in John chapter 15, where Jesus says, I am the vine, and you are the branches. And that suggests to me he is my sustenance. He is the one that my life is drawn from and flows from. And so, you know, as we're privileged by the Spirit, to, to consider these seven I am statements, it just reminds me once again that, that, that doctrine is what changes our lives and our character. It's these things that we know are realities about our God, about our Savior, 
that when we embrace them, they become the rock upon which our lives are built, the person and the characteristics of our God. And so as we look at today's passage in John 14, I'm going to go old school and use paper Bible here, use whatever Bible you have. Uh, we'll have no notes today. And we're going to be looking at John chapter 14, beginning with verse 1, to start with, where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And you know, we might not think about it that much, but really this concept of meaning of life, you know, I, I, as a counselor, this comes up almost every time with somebody, and as you try to trace back from the issues and the difficulties and the painful situations they're dealing with, you start to see that behind it, there is a meaning of life issue. Where is your meaning? We hear statements like, what use is my life? What use is it? That's a statement of worthlessness. Why bother? Sometimes we'll hear, and that's a statement of meaninglessness. And then even sometimes, I don't care anymore, a statement of, of futility. These are the kinds of thoughts, these are the kinds of experience that our enemy, the devil, wants us to live in, wants us to take a fetal position in. But our God, our Savior, our Lord Jesus, he wants to heal us and break us free from those things. And so again, as we look at John chapter 14, I would like to read for you the first seven verses. And here we go. John chapter 14, beginning with verse 1. Do not let your heart be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so I'd like to take a look at that I am statement. And there's so many areas of, of human life, of human difficulty, that that can be the rock upon which we deal with these things. You know, everything Jesus said was profound. But there's two particular statements he makes that I'd like to draw attention to today that I feel will act as sort of the overarching umbrella upon which we will then be able to understand all the seven I am statements, and particularly today's I am the way, the truth, and the life. First, Jesus said that anyone who hears his words and acts on them is like a man who builds his house on a rock, a firm foundation. And in another place, Jesus said, whoever loses their life for him truly finds it. And as I think about these two sort of overarching fundamental statements of Jesus, I find within that the seven I am statements. The seven I am statements are, are drawing us back to the foundation, the bedrock of building our lives, having our lives built upon Jesus, who he is, and as he describes himself in these seven I am statements. And then I also see it in our response to who Jesus is, is our response is to yield, is to give our lives over to him, to lose our lives as we see it, and as we would want it, and as we would guide it, and as we would carry it out, and to lose that and to gain the life that Jesus has for us in him. 
And as we think of those two foundational truths, we come to today's Jesus is the way. Jesus is the way by which. Jesus is the truth. He is the reality of the reality in which. And Jesus is the life. Jesus is the nature through which we experience true, true life. The way by Jesus, in Jesus, through Jesus. It is by and in and through Jesus that one finds their eternal worth. One of usefulness to God. It makes me think of the book of Philemon. Beautiful book. Read it. One chapter. Lovely story. And in that, a, a runaway slave finds the Lord Jesus. And the statement is made of him. He was once useless, but now he is useful. That's the change. That's the meaning of life one finds in Jesus, eternal life. It is by and in and through Jesus one finds eternal purpose, a present that leads to a future. A scripture that tells us that. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. To think that God even offers us that opportunity to bring him glory hmm. should just overwhelm us. It is by and in and through Jesus one finds true eternal meaning, meaningful service in the kingdom of God. In 1 Peter 2.9 it says you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people who belongs to God. Why? So that you may declare the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Wow. How much more meaning can one have than that? A priest of Jesus an ambassador for Jesus. And so again, as we look at our passage today, there's a little bit of a background. It's a tender passage. There's so much that can be taught on it, and, and we won't really have time for that, but as we, as we think about what's there, it's the background of a first century Jewish wedding ceremony. The betrothal has happened. The bridegroom has already betrothed himself to the bride. The bride has betrothed herself to the bridegroom. And so now the bridegroom leaves the household of the betrothed wife and he goes back to his father's house to prepare a home for them to live in. And he goes back. And as Jesus said, he left his own. He went back to the father to prepare a house for us, his bride. And as surely as he went away, Jesus says, he will come back and he will take his bride, the church. He will take you, he will take I, and he will bring us back to be where he is with him in heaven forever. And that's the background of the passage through which Jesus makes this amazing bedrock statement that he is I am, Jesus said, the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. And I want to look at four ways that that truth is, is vital and is powerful and is freeing and is healing for us in things that we have to deal with in life. First, it is by and in and through Jesus that we truly experience relationships the way they are meant to be. It is by and through Jesus that we find the counter to distorting relationships, to abusing relationships, to making relationships idolatrous. It is by and through Jesus that we find how being right with God, first and foremost, is the key. It is the key for every other relationship we have. Through the most intimate, 
to the lesser intimate, how they are meant to operate under that first and fundamental and foremost relationship, your relationship with your Savior. I like to share with people that I counsel with, there's a difference between being a people blesser and a people pleaser. A people pleaser starts from themselves. They start from their resources. They start from their ideas of how this thing should be fixed, how this thing should work. And they try to please the other person in the relationship. And let me tell you, that's disastrous. That doesn't work. That causes enabling. That causes distortion. That causes self-centered giving, in a sense. Being a people pleaser. Whereas in Christ, and through Christ, and by Christ, we can really be people blessers. We can bless people. How does blessing happen? It comes first from God. It's like rain. You know, it said of the land of Egypt, God said, I'm taking you from a land that doesn't get rained on. It draws its water from its own pool, from its own source. I'm taking to you to a land that is fed from heaven, from the pure water that comes down from heaven. And that's how relationships are meant to work. That's how we bless others in our relationship. We draw from our Savior. We let him fill us with his righteousness, with his peace, with his joy. And as he overflows us, it goes toward those that we love and are in relationship with. That's how we bless. Jesus is the way, the reality, and the life source of those kinds of relationships. And so I ask you the question, are you a people pleaser? Or would you desire today to ask Jesus to make you a people blesser? Oh, how, how lives would be transformed. As we think about Jesus being the way, the truth of the life, another area that that was really the rock, the bedrock for, is in the area of overcoming crippling fear and vulnerability. So many folks are dealing with crippling fear and the vulnerability. They've been hurt. They've been abused. They've been abandoned in the past, and that hurt has made them feel so vulnerable, and the vulnerability creates fear, fear of change, even fear of healing. It is through and in and by Jesus that our need is met because God provides for us a faithful, unending love, and it's in the strength of that that we can, we can again engage in relationships with others, that we can, we can have the courage and the, and the fortitude to, to step into proper relationships with others and, and to put ourselves out there wisely. It's on the strength of having that unending, unalterable, unassailable relationship with God. The scripture, Romans 8, 38, 39, you, you all know it. I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There is no separation. That is unassailable. That is no vulnerability, and it's in the strength of that that we can engage, yes, in relationships that are going to have their difficulties, that are going to have their vulnerabilities. But why? But because we're still on the bedrock of that relationship with Christ. So I ask you the question, are you suffering today? from the crippling fear that has come because of past hurt, past abandonment, past abuse? Is your, is your hurt, is your fear speaking louder to you than your faith? Oh, don't let it. Fear is an enemy. Fear is a tool of the devil. Perfect love casts out fear. There's no fear in love. 
It is by and in and through Jesus that we have the way, the reality, and the life source to get up from that fetal position of fear and to engage relationships for the kingdom of God. Another area that's so paralyzing to many is the area of guilt and shame. It is by and in and through Jesus that we find the power, the way, the truth, the reality, the life source to overcome paralyzing guilt and shame. Jesus paid the price for that. The same truth of God that teaches us how sinful, how ugly, how awful our sin was. It's the same Bible, the same truth that tells us that Jesus did everything to take that away. Don't take one truth without the other. If you own your sin, then own the forgiveness that comes through Christ and move on from paralyzing guilt and shame. The scripture tells us in Romans 8 and verse 1, therefore, there is now no condemnation, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Wow. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life to overcome paralyzing guilt and shame. And so I ask you again the question, is my sin, is your sin bigger to you than your Savior? We know the answer is no. God forbid. And then lastly, Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life. It is by, it is in, and it is through Jesus that we have the key to having ultimate purpose. Knowing Jesus meets our need of having a meaningful and purposeful life. As I've already quoted from 1 Peter 2.9, you are a royal priesthood to declare the praises of him who's called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. What more purpose in life could one want? I mean, part of the cabinet of the president? Part of the royal entourage of a king? Yes, of the king of kings. No higher calling than that. To be a priest for God. You know, I get to see kingdom priesthood in operation at the, at the gospel mission that I have the privilege of ministering to. I see men there, men who were hurt, men who have been healed, men who are healing, and they reach out to other men who are hurting. They say, come on alongside with me, brother. I've, I've walked this path in front of you. I see that kind of priesthood. It's amazing. It's, it's, it's empowering. It's life-changing. It's life-saving. So I ask you a question. Am I, are you dedicating all that you are, your time, your talent, and your treasure to the kingdom of God? Are you owning your role as a priest of God? What does a priest do? He prays. He intercedes. He takes a stand. He comes alongside. He lifts up the arms that hang down. He rebukes if necessary. He corrects. He holds up. And an ambassador. Think of it. That we are citizens of a heavenly kingdom. A heavenly kingdom that operates on true and righteous principles. The Bible says the kingdom of God is all about righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. These are the ways of life that we can represent to a hurting, desperate world who doesn't know righteousness, that doesn't know peace, it has no true joy. Wow, what a role. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life.
as I think about these truths, I'm just amazed and thankful and overwhelmed at the privilege that I have, that you have in Christ Jesus to be in the good of all that he is, to be able to have my life built upon the rock of Jesus, the rock of who he is, the bread of life, the light of the world, the door, the good shepherd, the resurrection and the life, the way, the truth, and the life, and the nurturing, sustaining vine of which we are the branches. You know, as I, again, I, I'm just so thankful, so thankful, you know, that some 39 years ago, the Lord found me and saved me and brought me to himself, delivered me from myself, delivered me from my idolatries, delivered me from wanting to run relationships my way and for me, and has delivered me into this truth that he must be, he should be, he has to be at the top of that relationship loyalties pyramid. He has to be the one that I am first and foremost dedicated to. And it is through that that I've had the privilege of enjoying marital relationship and family relationships that really bless, that give true meaning of life because it all comes from him. Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Amen? Amen. 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 You know, it's at this time that we, um, if I'm looking at the clock right, I'm trying to be timely. I'm um, not always here, so I'm, I'm a little new to this, so I think it's our time to go ahead and transition to um, communion. And as we think of communion, what a, what a great way that Jesus has left us to express gratitude and thankfulness and thankfulness back to him for what he's done for us. It's, it's a memorial feast. It makes us remember that Jesus gave his life so that we might have life. That Jesus was willing to lay his life down to be our way to the Father, that Jesus was willing to lay down his life to be the truth or the reality of being a child of God, that he was willing to lay down his life to be able to connect us with the true life of God. And as we take communion, it's a fellowship. It's something we, we show that we have in common as Christians. You know, as a Christian, we have the most in common of any people on the planet. We have Jesus. We have the Spirit of God in our heart. The Spirit of God bears witness that you are a child of God, that I am a child of God. And it connects us. And in communion, we connect with one another, but most of all, we connect with Jesus. And we take that, that step of saying, Jesus, thank you. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for being my Savior. Thank you for being my Lord. The symbols, they speak of that body that was offered up, that blood that was shed. No one appreciated life like Jesus did, and yet he was still willing to yield his life up for me. The scripture, I love it, for the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross. We have a joyful Savior. He's rejoicing over you this morning. He's rejoicing over, over me this morning. And as we take communion, let's remember him in his death until he come. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you again for the opportunity to have this communion fellowship. Lord, we want to thank you so much for dying for us and saving our souls. Lord, and as we take this communion, 
We take the bread to remember the body you yielded up. We take the cup, Lord, to remember the blood you shed to cleanse us from our sin and make us right before our God. Thank you, Jesus. And as we take this communion, Lord, may we put a smile on your face. For that's our desire. In Jesus' name.